Here's your host. He's a few no ops short of an exploit. Socially engineers the elderly. Earns his Mardi Gras beads the old-fashioned way, and is known as the kill bit at parties, Paul Isidorian. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very special edition of Paul.com Security Weekly, broadcasting to you live on a Tuesday, Fat Tuesday, in fact, and thankfully... Who are you calling fat? Thankfully, Jack, who is not fat, um... More old, but <laughs> <laughs> new record, new wow. record. <laughs> he brought the beads um, that he handmade as a child before That's they had straight. things like polymer plastics. <laughs> so these are non-cancerous. <laughs> yeah, these are handmade, old-fashioned. Welcome, Jack. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. He's adorned in a. Is that a jester hat? Yes. Is it from the times where they actually had jesters? That's right. Is that like yes, your, you your know. brother's job? Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you had to do what you had to do that's after right. school, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Someone had to entertain somebody, the king. Somebody had, that's right. Somebody had to entertain the king and, <laughs> and shovel out the midden, you know, whatever. <laughs> Allison Nixon is here with us. Welcome, Allison, to the Hi, show. Hi, everybody. You're adorned in a quite a wide assortment of beads. They had shiny things here, so I took them. Yes, and how did you earned your beads by taking the bag from Jack and putting them on? I watched you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like those are mine. Thank That's you. That's right. Shiny. You may have one or two. The rest Shiny. are mine. <sighs> Patrick Laverty's here with us in the studio, hanging out with us on a Tuesday. Hello, interwebs from snowy Rhode Island. How is uh, how are we doing on B sides, Rhode Island? We are doing awesome. People are signing up left and right. I I can't wait. I, I wish Do we, we have more than, than one person attending. I think we're up to about three. No, we we have plenty. We, we have, have tickets are going than, fast. More than ten? I, yes, absolutely, we do. I, I wish it was June fifteenth tomorrow. Me too. Well, not really, because we have a lot of work to do before then. <laughs> we do. But at least we have an awesome lineup of speakers <coughs> ready to go. Uh, speakers which include Bruce Potter, Joe McRae, Ron Gula, Ben Jackson, Dave Mayner, Josh Wright, who is here with us on the show. Well, not actually here with us yet, but he will be here with us on the show. Um, sushi. Yes, Mr. Sushi himself. So, B-Sides Rhode Island, link in the show notes to get tickets June 15th, now on sale. B-SidesRI.Eventbrite.com. Go get your tickets today. Also, if you want to see offensive countermeasures, take the class, be there live with John Strand as he t teaches in sweats and it sprays out into the classroom. <laughs> it's magical experience for those of you that haven't been there before. Offensive countermeasures, the art of active defense is running in Black Hat Europe, March 12th through the 15th. Sands Orlando, March 8th through the 9th. And Sands Fire in Washington, D.C., June 15th through the 16th. Uh, all the links to register for those classes are in the show notes. Uh, check out the Stogie Geek show after this. Uh, it's kind of a weird. It's usually every Thursday nights, but we're on a Tuesday. So it might just be Mark Jr. and myself. And I will be there with him to celebrate his birthday. Because no one else could show up. So if anyone wants to hang out afterwards and help me celebrate Mark Jr.'s birthday, that would be awesome. And so I'm not the only one singing happy birthday because that's just kind of weird. Um... <laughs> So, get 15% off all online forensic courses with the discount code 0124 underscore F 0 R 15 until February 20th. That's right. That discount code and all the links to find out more about our wonderful sponsor Sands and their forensics um, programs that are happening. The link is in the show notes. Okay. And again, this is episode 320. Um, it is Tuesday, February 12th. And um, we're just about to jump into our interview, which, of course, I'm always excited to have all the people we uh, interview on the show. Uh, this one is a topic that's of special interest to me because everyone knows how much I love embedded devices and security. Craig Hefner is with us. He's a vulnerability researcher with Tactical Network Solutions in Columbia, Maryland, which is also where Tenable Network Security Headquarters hey, is. Yeah, I've heard of that place. Yeah, so we're going to hang out with Craig next time we go down there. Uh, he has six years of experience analyzing wireless and embedded systems and operates the Dev TTY S0 blog, which I refer to on a very regular basis, which is dedicated to embedded hacking topics. He's presented at such events as Black Hat and DEF CON and teaches embedded device exploitation courses. His skin has never been exposed to sunlight and is bioluminescent at 200 meters. Interesting. I'm going to have to look that up. Bioluminescent. I have no idea what that means. Craig, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. How you doing? It's good to have you here. 
So, Craig, how did you get your start in information security? So, <clears throat> it's interesting. I was, um, I was actually deployed in the military in Afghanistan. And I said, well, sitting in the desert kind of sucks. <laughs> So I want to do something else. And so I started getting into um, computer stuff and the security aspect just really appealed to me. Um, I like making things do stuff besides what they're designed to do. And I love taking stuff apart. Um, and it started off just as a hobby and I got really lucky. I met some really great people along the way who kind of helped me get started and, and kind of get into the industry and thankfully get a job doing what I really enjoy doing, which is awesome. That's very cool. So are you uh, pretty much just focused on uh, embedded device security now? I am now, yeah. Um, I, I've done a lot of stuff in the past, mostly network uh, protocol stuff, uh, wireless stuff. But um, TNS, who I work for now, has said, hey, if you want to do embedded stuff, that sounds awesome. You go do embedded stuff. So that's what I get to do now, and it's really cool. What are some of the most common problems found in the security of embedded systems? So... Go back about 15 years in computer security and pick every problem we've had from then to now and you'll find it in embedded systems. Uh, why, why, why is that? I, know, I, I, I totally agree with your sentiments, but I've always been curious why that is. So I think it's a combination of things. First of all, I don't think embedded stuff has really gotten a lot of, of pressure and it's starting to get a lot more uh, analysis from security experts now, yeah. I think, in the past couple of years. No, but no. It, it really hasn't historically been a, been a big target. Um, and I think a lot of people are realizing now, hey, shit, all of our network infrastructure gear are these embedded systems. All of our routers, our access points, our switches, our VPNs, our security devices that we install are all these embedded systems. And if we can't protect those, what the hell are we going to do? Um, but, I mean, from, from a vendor standpoint, historically, it's... A lot of it is time to market. You know, you've got developers who are pushed to get a product out before the competition does. Um, and really, if you look at it, customers don't care in general. Customers don't care about security. I mean, when's the last time you saw a bad review on Amazon because some device they bought had a buffer overflow in it? Mm. I mean, they, they care more about features than, than security, and that's what sells. And so they focus on adding features rather than securing their systems. Um, so I think a combination of those things um, has really kind of led to um, a lot of lackadaisical programming uh, in embedded systems and just a general kind of nonchalantness about security. Are the problems predominantly configuration-based or are they more of the programming error and buffer overflow-based problems? So I'd say both, really. Um, I mean, obviously, configuration-based stuff is the easy-to-find, low-hanging fruit. Um, uh, you look at stuff like the, the UPnP stuff that people have been looking at recently where they, you know, they actually start scanning the internet and say, hey, how many devices on the internet actually have UPnP on the WAN, which is clearly a bad configuration. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it turns out there's a lot that do. Um, so, and, but if you start looking deeper into these systems with, you know, you know, pop something up in IDA and start looking for buffer overflows, you just have stupid, stupid stack overflows. Um, I was looking at a device not long ago where the login, uh, it was a CGI page, it was a web-based interface, and the login uh, CGI page took the username and the password and stir copied them to the stack. <laughs> and stir copy is like the root of all evil. Any programmer who's ever worked in C knows not to use it, but they were just like, yeah, for no reason, we're just going to stir copy to the stack. And yeah, you know, so it's interesting cool. you build up the web interface thing. Uh, a lot of the web interfaces and management things, uh, management interfaces that are CGI based, as you describe, often suffer from really horrible problems. It's almost like either they share a lot of the same code base or for whatever reason, people just don't pay attention at all to security in the web management software. Why is that? And well, like, what are some examples of where that might stem from. So the big issue with the web interface is, let's say you have a Linux-based device, lots of Linux-based embedded systems out there. Um, the reason people choose Linux-based stuff is because they can pull off-the-shelf, open-source stuff, mm. throw it in, and it works. And if you're using you know, known, stable stuff that people have looked at for years, you're probably OK. Where people get in real trouble is where they either roll their own code 
or they start modifying the open source stuff and they screw it up. And the web interface is a prime target because it's the most likely place where they started customizing stuff. Yeah. Because everyone wants to have like a custom web interface because that's the main interface that you see when you go to configure the device or you log into the device or whatever. Um, so I think that the reason why the web server is such a, a good target is because it is the thing that has been developed internally, hasn't gotten a lot of QA, hasn't really gone through a lot of testing. And so it, it ends up having a lot of bugs in it. And the web servers themselves seem to be more prone to problems because of the memory and uh, space constraints that you have in an embedded system. You don't always get a nice, happy, lovely Apache installation on your embedded right. system. It's usually this embedded web server or some binary that's doing the management interface and the web serving all in one. Right, yeah. And, I mean, there, there are some devices that are relatively well-powered and do run Apache, and that's great. Uh, but then they'll, you know, write Apache modules, and those have, you know, SQL injection in them and whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you still have issues there. But, yeah, a lot of the devices, they're running, again, they probably pulled some open source uh, web server that's designed to run on an embedded system, and they hacked it together to work with what they wanted and to work with their hardware and to serve out the files they wanted and do whatever they needed. And in the process of doing that, have just totally screwed up the security on the system. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Uh, so do you find that Linux is becoming more and more popular? Do you find it just keeps growing in popularity for use on embedded systems? Yeah, I do. And most of the devices I look at are Linux-based. Um, not necessarily because I seek out Linux specifically. Uh, there are obviously a lot of real-time operating systems out there that are very popular, like VxWorks and Lynx OS and several others. Um, but Linux is, is really, I think, very attractive to people developing and, and vendors developing products because uh, it's a familiar operating system that their developers probably already use anyway. And it's easy to get spun up really quickly with the product. Um, so you don't have to teach your developers a whole new programming environment or a whole new OS. Um, you just say, hey, go use Linux. You already know how to use that anyway. And you get the product out the door a lot faster. Right, right, right. Is it... Um do you think it's the, the processor architecture? Like, how does that play into um, the security of embedded systems? Because I find that can really be, can be annoying, <laughs> and it can cause you to have to do a lot of work to maybe not so much find exploits, but get exploits working, is the, the processor architecture. Yeah, yeah, and it depends on the, on the exploit, too. Like, if it's a configuration issue, like you talked about earlier, uh, the, the architecture plays far less of a role. And that's why I love those kind of exploits, because they're yeah. cross-platform. Cross and, and you know what? You know what? Logic bugs, I, I love buffer overflows, but man, logic bugs are beautiful. Mm. Because, you know, they work across all firmware versions with no problem, yeah. and they're great. Um, but we, when you get into the lower level stuff, like buffer overflows, yeah, the architecture is a big thing. Um, so I deal a lot with MIPS, for example. Mm -hmm. And and MIPS architecture, getting um, a stack overflow to work, there are a lot of things that make it easier because yeah, there's, there's, there's less system calls to begin with, right? Yeah, you have and, a smaller and, a smaller code base or smaller uh, operating system instructions or uh, processor instructions rather. Than yeah, you and you there. also have problems where um, MIPS is a risk system architecture. So if you're doing like a re return to libc or something, you can't just return to system in libc like you can on Intel. Uh, because uh, on a 32-bit Intel system, that is a simple exploit where you just, you know, you put your argument, put into your argument on the stack, and then you return to system. Well, arguments are passed in registers in MIPS. Yeah. So you actually have to do return-oriented programming to get your stuff loaded up into the registers correctly and then call into a function in the library. Uh, so even a simple exploit uh, becomes not too difficult, but more difficult than it is on a traditional Intel-based system. Mm -hmm. Uh, but on the other hand, you don't have a lot of the protections that Intel-based systems have gotten over the years. So you give a little, take a little. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Um, so there are some Intel uh, processor instruction set-based processors in embedded systems, right. as well as ARM, as well as MIPS. Uh, what, in terms of the inherent protections of buffer overflows or any kind of security, do they have built into them in embedded systems that you're finding, if any? So you find that they typically will have at least stack randomization. Mm -hmm. um, depending on the architecture, they will probably have the stack at least marked as non-executable. Uh, ARM, for example, will most likely have it marked as non-executable. Uh, MIPS, on the other hand, MIPS processors don't support the no-execute bit. 
So they almost always have the stack marked as executable. So you don't even have to worry about making the stack executable before you jump back to it. Um, there are um, there are there are protections for architectures like MIPS and ARM um, the, in Linux. The problem is that a lot of um, developers and a lot of companies are not using new enough uh, tool chains or new enough versions of, of Linux to take advantage of those. Or if they are, they just disable them completely for God knows whatever reason. Um, so uh, the, the protections exist. They can be taken advantage of. But I have yet to see anyone really take advantage of the protections that, that Linux can offer on an embedded device. Um, describe to those that have never done any kind of cross-compiling what that's like without <laughs> crawling in the fetal position and crying like a little girl, which is how I deal with the problem. <laughs> it's, it can be a real bitch. Well, explain to people what... Um, I guess we should do a little... some of the foundations, right? Um, you mentioned real-time operating system explain what that is and then go on to explain um, the um, cross compiler. All right, so so think of a real-time operating system as just one big kernel, really. Most of them are. And that's it. There's really no file system. Um, they have minimal th uh, support for things like threading, so you can mo execute multiple things at once. Um, but you don't have like a proper file system. There's no separation of user code and kernel code and things like that. Everything just runs in kernel space and that's it. Um, you can think of it as, you know, if you wanted to write an HTTP server for Linux, writing it as a kernel module and then loading it into the kernel. Yeah. That's effectively what they're doing. But with that's important for embedded devices. It's not so important for our servers and desktops and other things, but if you think of how an airplane works, you'd want everything to be running in kernel space and, and just happening, right? There's, you know. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the advantage of, of a real-time operating system is you can very tightly control timings and things like that. And where, where that's necessary, they absolutely have a big advantage. Yeah. Um, I, there, there are some efforts to do, uh, like, run Linux in real time, uh, but I haven't seen it really adapted uh, or adopted, rather, that much uh, myself. So then now cross-compiling. <laughs> Cross-compiling um, is where you have, say, your Intel, your Ubuntu, whatever, running on your PC, right? Your Intel PC. And you want to build an executable that will run on a MIPS or an ARM PC, or embedded system, more likely. Um, so what you have to do is you have to build a compiler where the compiler runs on your system, but builds binaries that will run on a different system. Um, and getting that set up can be very difficult. Um, there are some some really nice projects out there that make it a lot easier. Things like Cross Tool NG and Build Root, which will build. Yeah, it was um, when I was doing open work development. It was Build Root that I was using for that to cross compile. Yeah, and that it makes it so much easier to put together cross compilers. It's so nice. Um, you do run into issues though, where some times it won't work mm. on the particular device you're using. Um, for example, I had a device that was was running MIPS and. It was actually running a special Broadcom version of MIPS. And so Broadcom had apparently changed some instructions. So normal MIPS instructions were no longer valid on that processor. Um, so you actually had to get the special GCC version with the Broadcom modifications in order to, to build anything that would run on it. And why does Broadcom uh, hate us so much? <laughs> <laughs> Bucket, I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, they, it, well, they, we, they we were writing the... And, we're, yeah, and, go ahead. And, to, to be honest, I, I love their, the code that they write. Um, I don't think I've seen well-written code come out of Broadcom ever. Yeah. So, I, 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 when we were writing them, the, the Linksys WRT54G book, you know, all the processors were, were Broadcom-based. And it was it, just painful, painful yeah, process. Yeah, the, I mean, the wireless drivers were Broadcom, <laughs> too. And, yeah, my, um, one of the guys I work with, Zach, um, was looking at some, uh, an embedded system. And it was actually fairly well locked down. They had done a pretty good job with the programming. You could tell the guys who had worked on the code, you know, were conscious about security. And then he found this one service running that was written by Broadcom and that they threw in there. And sure enough, he found a Stack Overflow right off the bat, and that was the end of it. So, yeah, I love Broadcom, but. <laughs> so what what are some of the first steps that you would take if I were to give you a device? Say it's an embedded device. It has firmware. You know, go go have at it. What what is kind of like some of the uh, processes which you do to assess the security on them? So I've got the if I have the device, the first thing I usually do is just take it apart. 
because mm -hmm. um, that's going to give me an idea of what processor it's running, how much memory it has, how much storage it has right off the bat. Um, you can also look for things like um, JTAG and serial ports on there, which can give you access to underlying system, which are great to have. Um, the next thing I'll do is I'll look for the firmware. So if I can go to the vendor website and get the firmware, or if I can pull it off the device, um, that's going to be key, obviously, to analyzing the firmware is having it in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, uh, once you have the firmware, you've kind of got like this big blob of crap and you don't know what's in it, and it's probably in some proprietary format. It's not like something that's well-structured and documented most of the time. Um, so that's why I wrote Binwalk, is I said, hey... I was going to say, Binwalk is a fantastic tool. Yeah, well, it's a really I, awesome I, tool. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I, I, kinda, I just got tired of manually going through and looking for file signatures and stuff, and I was like, there's... We have the technology. We can fix this. We can make it better. Isn't that why right? we write so, programs, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is, this is why I learned to code, is so I can make the computer do work for me. Um, all right, that's right. So, yeah, yeah, and, and Binwalk is, is really useful. I use it all the time, obviously. Um, so so once, once you have an idea of what's in the, in the firmware, you can extract it, pull out files, pull out code. Um, and then usually I'll start to start taking a look at um, how, what runs at startup. What services do they have active? What's listening on ports? What's their configuration for those devices? Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times just looking at the configuration for a service can tell you a lot about, you know, what parts they're protecting, what parts they aren't protecting. Uh, for example, in web servers, you know, you can find, say, they say, hey, they're protecting these files, but they're not protecting these files over here. Let's go take a look at those and see what they do. Um, so that, that helps narrow down the focus of, of what you want to want to look at for vulnerabilities. Yeah, absolutely. So, now, how do you use, do you use JTAG very often in your um, analysis of the security of the device? So, I use JTAG very rarely, actually. Um, it's kind JTAG is kind of a pain in the butt to do, um, unless you have all of the specs for it. Um, in which case, it becomes a lot easier. But typically, for the devices I look at, I don't have anything. Um, mostly what I use JTAG for is actually pulling the firmware off the device. Yeah. And usually I can find an easier way to do that, either um, getting a root shell on the serial port or uh, dumping the device, just doing a raw dump of the flash chip itself, I find is usually easier right. Right. Than, than trying to, to think, fiddle and, around with JTAG. And JTAG is so much more than that, but at its core, it's direct access to all of the hardware on the system. It just so happens that the flash chip is one of those pieces of hardware that JTAG gives you access to, so you can cut block copy that stuff off. Yeah, I mean, it really stems from when, when devices started getting so complex, they were hard to probe and hard to test. I mean, you know, these little chips on the board, um, the, the hardware developer said, hey, we need a way to easily test these. And that's, that's kind of where JTAG came from, is, you know, it, it allows you to test connections between chips and, and test different functionality. And it's kind of um, snowballed from there. There's a lot more functionality, like you said, in it now, especially with things like you can do CPU debugging and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do a lot of stuff with um, like Linux kernel exploitation, and most of that's because I don't have to. Mm -hmm. I can find lots of easier bugs in the applications. Right. Um, so, so I don't really use JTAG for debugging very much. So what are some of the things that you teach in uh, your class that we might not have talked about yet? So the class is basically, it's a two-day class, and it's pretty much split into first day is hardware, second day is firmware. Um, and we cover, you know, the first day with hardware, we kind of cover all the basics, like, okay, let's take the device apart and identify the chips in it, look them up on Google, figure out what they do, how they work, that kind of thing. We do um, raw flash dumps, so, you know, if you can't get in through JTAG, if you don't have a firmware update from the vendor, if you, there's no serial port, you can hook onto the chip and actually pull the firmware off oh, really? I didn't know without that. any other interface there. Yeah. Um, I know so, on some of the early Linksys devices, you could jump or two pins and it would reset the firmware. And that was yeah, ill-advised. If you don't know what doing, that's really dangerous. I know many people who break their stuff. Yeah, because right yeah, if you mash the pins just enough, they'll touch another pin and then it's shorted for good. Yeah. Yeah, so, so our, obviously our, our goal is to pull the firmware off without shorting anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, we want it... You know, as is on the chip, so that so that we can actually see exactly what what's running. Nice. Uh, but we once we have the the first day with hardware is really just using hardware to get access to firmware and access to the underlying system, and then the second day is firmware analysis where we go through. Okay, let's start extracting stuff from the firmware. Let's start identifying stuff. Let's start start analyzing stuff for vulnerabilities. 
And by the end of the class, the students find, um, uh, well, I guess they technically are O days. They're not published, and the vendor doesn't know about them. So they actually find O days in off the shelf uh, consumer gear. Now, do you use a standard set of consumer gear for that, or do you kind of change it up? Um, so, so we stick. We try and stick with the same model, mm -hmm. and we'll do that for as long as we can. Eventually, that model will stop being made, and we'll have to find something else. Gotcha. Um, and and that's for that reason. It's it's one. If you look at a lot of hardware classes, they actually will build their own hardware for the class. Yeah. The reason I don't want to do that is because I don't think people will believe me when I tell them that these simple vulnerabilities exist in the real world mm. uh, without actually having a device there to show them, hey, yeah, you're really hacking this device. This is really sold. People really use this. It's on the internet, and you can own it with you know, a simple get request from a web browser. Mm. So it, it's, it's, really, it's really interesting to see everyone be so shocked at the end of the class. They're like, well... Yeah. Crap. <laughs> One of the things that amazed me is uh, also, speaking of learning about firmware, as I'm sure you go through in the classes, how your firmware is structured, what's inside of your firmware. Can you kind of break down some of the different, like what is firmware? Um, because it's very different from how you view a traditional operating system. Uh, it is, and, I mean, there's a lot of similarities, especially when you're dealing with the Linux-based yeah. system. Uh, and, and there's a lot of differences too. So. You basically have all the major components you'd expect to find on a normal system. You've got a bootloader, mm -hmm. you've got a kernel, and you've got a file system with applications that run at boot up. Um, now, those are stored on a flash chip, which is very different from a typical hard drive. Um, so they're accessed differently, and Linux has like this abstraction layer it uses um, so that you can access them kind of like a normal hard drive you would with a normal hard drive yep. um, But flash is a whole other subject. It's it's kind of a weird beast uh, in some of the ways it operates, but um, I mean once the system boots up It's going to be a very very familiar environment I think for most people mm -hmm. if you've done anything with Linux before because you know if you've, you've got the, a serial console and you're watching the thing boot up You'll see the kernel boot up, and then it'll usually drop you right to a root prompt there, so you can debug stuff, and you'll, you know you can do process listings and see all the services that are running and um, things like that. It's very cool. I want to take your class. <laughs> you should. I, I highly encourage you to take my class. I, I'm in Columbia, Maryland, uh, quite often usually. So. Oh, um, good. Yeah, we hope to uh, hope to get down there. And for those interested, please uh, you know sign up for uh, for Craig, Craig's uh, class. So well, we we actually have a uh, a special offer for Paul.com viewers. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, so so we for if you go to our website tacnetsol.com slash Paul.com, and I'll, I'll send you a link so you can put it in okay. the, the weekly notes. Um, you can sign up for a ten percent discount off our Intro to EDE class, which is our embedded device exploitation class. Um, and we'll also be at ShmooCon this year. Um, so if you come by our table and mention that you heard us on Paul.com. Uh, you get a 15% discount at Shmoogon. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. Uh, Allison, did you have uh, any questions? A Allison and I recently collaborated. Uh, well, I, I think we exchanged email with you. Uh, yeah, we've so collaborated we, on some projects before. Yeah, we used Binwalk for a couple of projects, and I think that it's a ridiculously nifty tool. I've been, <laughs> like, in my free time, I've been downloading random firmware and just, like, scanning it with Binwalk. To see what it's addicting, it. isn't it? It's yeah. so addicting. Because you look at this big blob of stuff and you say, you know, there are files in here. I know it, but I don't know how to get them out. Uh, but you use Binwalk and you can carve them out pretty easily. Mm. Really yeah. interesting. Um, I would say my question is, if you're faced with some kind of router, uh, what are some like basic steps that you might want to take to find the most easiest to find vulnerabilities? <laughs> look, look in the web interface first. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, it's not really exciting or, or as exciting, but a lot of times just with the black box analysis, you can find stupid bugs. So if you just say, take a device, log into it normally as an administrator, log all the traffic that you see, like with uh, Burke Suite or whatever proxy you want to do, Wireshark, whatever. See all the web requests it makes, then log out and see if you can make those web requests without authentication. And surprisingly often, you can. So you can say, hey, I want to request the configuration for this device. And a lot of times you can download a configuration file without authentication, which has you know plain text passwords and everything else in it, uh, access CGI scripts without authentication. Um, I, Sorry, keep going. I, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. 
So, like, out of the sum total of vulnerabilities that you found, like, like, what proportion of those are on the management interface? Um, so, I tend to target the management inter interface primarily, um, and that there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, the web the web interface is a very nice target for several reasons. First of all, if I want a remote exploit, the most common service people are going to enable on the WAN is going to be the administration administration interface. Um, so the web service itself is also very easy to scan for in places like Shodan. Um, so it's really easy to find if you want to search the internet for it. Um, and even if they don't enable remote admin, you can still do reflective attacks with like cross-site request forgery off of people's browsers. So even if it's not enabled on the WAN, you can still attack it through, through um, uh, like JavaScript and stuff like that. Um, so I do tend to focus on the web, the web interface quite a bit uh, for, that, for those reasons. Um, but really anything, if there's anything that listens on the WAN by default, that's the first thing to go for. Because if there's something listening on the internet by default, that needs to be your primary target because there's nothing, people, are, people aren't going to disable that, they're not going to know it's there. Um, so I, I found several cases where devices will have, for example, TFTP, a TFTP service listening on the WAN, and you can just request any file you want off the, off the system, including, you know, Etsy password or anything else, and it'll just give it to you. Nice, that's so, awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> so when you're uh, doing like a buffer overflow, like trying to find a buffer overflow vulnerability, I'm assuming you just like type A's into everything until something breaks? So I usually start off with like a, with a static analysis. I, I do a, a lot of static analysis usually before I start doing dynamic stuff. Um, so I usually throw, if, if I take a binary of interest, I'll put it, take it and put it into IDA disassembler. Oh wait, so you don't take the actual firmware and bring it into IDA? Because it does support that, correct? Um, so if you just take a raw firmware image, like a firmware update image, IDA's not going to know what the heck that is. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have, um, if you just have raw code, you can import that into IDA. Okay, so like, you need the uh, binaries out of the firmware. Yeah, you, then you can tell it, yeah, this is, you know, MIPS code or ARM code, right. and then it'll start disassembling. But a lot of times for Linux-based stuff, what you want to do is take apart the, the file system and pull all the files out of there, because those are just Linux ELF files. Yeah, yeah. Now, IDA knows how to load those, right. and so you get a really good uh, disassembly and analysis from uh, it. Oh, I see. But now there's also emulators that you can actually boot the firmware on as well. Yeah, and what those, kind of emulators do you use? Yeah, those don't tie into IDA, but there is an right. emulation. Well, well IDA, IDA does actually have some support for those. Um, yeah, I've seen a couple. Of, it supports a Kind of tied in, yeah. yeah. Um, so I use QEMU, which I really like. It supports a lot of different architectures. And in fact, I always exclusively develop exploits in an emulated environment. So when if I'm working on a buffer overflow, um, I can develop a buffer, full buffer overflow exploit in an emulated environment using IDA and QEMU, and then throw it against the target device and know it'll work. So I can build, usually before I even buy a device, I've got an exploit built for it. Hmm. I just buy it to verify that it works and then ship it back to Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Return defective product. <laughs> Um, excellent. Does anyone else have any questions for, uh, for Craig? No? So, Craig, you said you would be at ShmooCon? Yep, I will be a booth babe at the TNS booth, so... Nice. Now, are you thing. speaking at ShmooCon, or...? I'm not. Unfortunately, ShmooCon, uh, did not want my talk, which released three VPNO days, so... Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I won't be talking, but, uh, I, w I will be at the booth. Now, have you, uh, have you submitted to, uh, Black Hat this year? Um, I have not. Um, I am considering doing one on MIPS exploitation there this year, though, so Excellent. I'm hoping to get that in. Very cool. Um, in your training classes, you can find a full schedule on your website? Yeah, if you go to uh, tagnetsoul.com and go to the training page, um, I think our next available class is going to be in April. The March class is already sold out. So, um, yeah, go in, sign up, get a spot while you can. What's the number one most vulnerable device that you could go on Amazon and buy right now and start playing around with that you can talk about? Anything by D-Link. <laughs> they, uh, we, we use them as an example in our, in our EDE class for a reason. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's good to know. That's good to know. Um, well, Craig, thank you very much for coming on the show. Uh, I learned some great tips about, uh, embedded device exploitation. Uh, keep up the great work with Binwalk. Again, we appreciate that tool. 
and um, and look for Craig at Schmookon. Thanks a lot, guys. It's great being here. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Craig. Thanks, everyone. And we will take a short break, come back, and we're going to be live with Josh Wright in just a few minutes, so stay tuned.